Uh, there you go. So, uh, welcome Leticia von Kruger Pimentel. And um, if you are ready, you can go with your presentation right away. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Alessandro for this invitation. As you've as you've heard um, in my presentation, I work in the heritage pro protection field, and we have many attachments to the writing of the uh, cities, the city forms. Um, once our object of work uh, are buildings and sites. I would like with this presentation to guide you through the ideas and observations that, that led me to the reflections I'm developing in my PhD studies. So my observations began on my professional practice as I work in a big city center of a big metropolitan region that went through many remodeling projects during the 20th century. I've observed that those renewing projects often took the project buildings out of their original environments and broke continuities of urban fabrics, as I'm going to uh, in, in a second. Uh, at the meeting of those fragments often arise voids or oh, uh, oh, some uh, uh, no and as, as slopes, space left over after planning. In the opposite way, it's not rare to watch a dynamic where protection act or the lack of those actions obstructs the implementation of the ide idealized pro uh, projects. This leads to the continuity of fragmented urban fabric and underutilized areas in the city. Facing that dynamic, I wonder to what extent does the protection of cultural heritage limit the dynamics of growth and occupation of the cities? So I would like to present you to Rio. I imagine most of you don't know the city. So this is uh, Brazil in South America. And this is the state of Rio de Janeiro in the uh, Southwest region in Brazil. So this is uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro within um, the state of Rio de Janeiro. And in the bottom here, this is the city center in the city of Rio de Janeiro. So um, the city of Rio has exactly the same area as, as it had when it was the federal district until 1960, the capital of Brazil. Um, the city was founded in 1565 and turned into the capital to reign of Portugal when the royal family moved to Brazil running from Napoleon's war in Europe in 1808. Rio has an area of 1.2 million kilo square kilometers and a population of almost 7 million people. So in the middle of the 19th century, the city didn't still experience an extension broader than it has for the last hundred years. For the end of extension towards north, north, this direction, and south, this direction, areas. What I want you to focus on in this map is the urban evolution matrix of it in the borders of a Protect and go bay. So I'm going to back here. Here, this is Guanabara Bay. You see, this is the entrance of Guanabara Bay, and this is the city center. So come back. Um, among four hills, which were firstly occupied, each one with a different religious order. So this is uh, those are the four hills. Santo Antonio Hills, uh, occupied by the Franciscans, 
Castelo Rio, occupied by Jesuits, São Bento Rio, occupied by Benedictines, and uh, the military order occupied Conceição Rio. So, close to the borders of the hills, streets and plots adjust to the, to the topography. Among them, in lowlands, the streets run into orthogonal planes. It's important to highlight that lowlands in the city were subject to flooding once were in humid areas. Many lagoons in these areas have been landfilled over time. So this is, uh, at that time, the city was still very inserted in the limits of the quadrilateral formed by the four hills. Here you can see in this panoramic view. Oh, I'm sorry. São Bento Hill, Conceição Hill, Santo Antonio Hill, and Castelo Hill, and the city here, in, in between, uh, in, among those four hills. Um, It's uh, in, the, in that time, it was beginning the extension towards north and south. The city has gained extension in the north edge with some long landfills of lagoons and channeling and rectification of rivers here in this area. And it started to explore and occupy the southern zone here, all oh, through the coast. So in the beginning of the 20th century, already a Republican capital, the city experienced the first big renewing projects. The central, here we have the four hills and the central avenue opening, linking the two waterfronts of the city center. Oh my God. Here, the docks in the north. And here the coast in the south. Here we see the first huge landfills permitted by the dismount of one of the hills close to the city center. This is Senate Hill. There was another hill here. And it was dismounted to landfill the docks uh, in North uh, Shore in Rio in the city center. And we see here the, the introduction of the first cuts on main hills of the foundation core here in Castelo Hill to rectify this avenue, this big avenue, to make it straight, to have to cut part of the, of the hill. So uh, this is the plan of Central Avenue opening in 1906. Uh, as you can see uh, in the detail here, in the detail here, the new street alignment profoundly changed the urban fabric, its property divisions, and its relations to the original topography, rectifying one of the edges of Castello Hill here. This is uh, this mount of the hill, the first dismount of the hill. Actually, the second, there was a small one to, the, to a hospital in the other side of the hill. All the new plots was, were quickly bought and occupied by buildings projected into the premises, principles of eclectism. This is, uh, this is one, this is number 46, is where IFAN uh, operates now. One of the remainings, uh, we've lost many of them by now. So as you can see in the top picture, uh, the cut of the hill, the public new buildings, the cut of the hill here, and the public new buildings, this theater, the National Theater, the National Library, and here behind the National Museum of Fine Arts. In the south edge, of the avenue. This is the south edge of the avenue. In the bottom picture, the north edge of the avenue 
shows that all the extent of the avenue was amplified in truly odd phases between 1903 and 1906, it was over. So in, nine, in uh, 1924, the complete dismount, so we have here, these three remaining uh, hills, the opening of the Central Avenue, uh, the land view of the docks, and uh, uh, the complete dismount of Castello Hill introduced a huge change to the city center, gaining flat extension, uh, flat, uh, flat extension area, even where the hill ones were, were settled, and in the new lands provided by its land transferred over the sea. So different from the plan of the Central Avenue, this Castello Esplanade had many plans and was not occupied at once. Until today, we can observe many voids in the area. So this was the picture of the place during 20s, the 20s and 30s. Uh, looks like a word work so in this photo you can you can uh, uh, see the amount of land created uh, through this operation here uh, where the hill was settled and here where uh, the land view over the city and uh, here I should like uh, to highlight some uh, of the issues we still face nowadays. Um, this is Santa Luzia Church, and this is Santa Casa, that means Holy House, Santa Casa Hospital, all of this, the ancient Santa Casa Hospital, and the new one of, uh, from the middle 19th century. Um, and at that time, they had huge, those buildings had huge social, social significance, what I believe was uh, crucial for their maintenance. Uh, all these small buildings here have been demolished, and this line goes beyond uh, uh, this area. Uh, the picture introduces to one of our very actual issues that is the sewing uh, of fragmented urban fabrics. Uh, how to integrate the new settlement drawing to the old fabric here. So uh, here is the land gained to the sea uh, in this operation. So in the 1930s, he gained a new plan, a general master plan of enhancement, expansion, and beauty. The planner of Ferredo Agash was French and had influences of Haussmann's plans for, um, for Paris. In this plan, let me see, let me show you the hills, the Central Avenue, the Castello Hill dismounted, so in this plan, Agash introduces projects that were implemented years ahead, like the dismount of Sant Antonio Hill and the opening of a new avenue towards the north. Here, yeah. all projects facing and proposing improvement of the circulation systems. Proposes also a huge enlargement of land fields all around the borderline here. Uh, this is a very small map to, to mark, so, but it comes all this way here. Uh, this is Agash's uh, proposal for uh, Castello Esplanade. Uh, we can see here the proposal about uh, the historical buildings, uh, the remaining historical buildings here, the National Historical Museum, here the hospital of uh, Santa Casa, uh, reduced in two aisles here, here Santa Luzia, well, sorry, here Santa Luzia Church. Uh, 
there were proposals for those uh, buildings, although uh, there was not yet a protection service in Brazil at that time. So, as you can see, he proposes uh, the enlarge of the land field here and plants a whole new different urban fabric for the area that goes towards the remaining colonial urban fabric as seen in the top right picture. You see, it's a complete new. And here we can see uh, the same proposal uh, for uh, Santo Antonio Hill here. So here is the area of Castello Hill, and here is Santo Antonio Hill. This is a very completely different city. Those headquarters were filled by a very particular typology, typology of buildings with covered public passes on the ground store. This plan was in effect for a small period of time, so it was not completely built. And in the 1940s, new proposals replaced, replaced part of this plan. So in the 1940s, the dean of Presidente Vargas, Presidente Vargas Avenue, introduced by Agash in his, in his master plan, happened in 1940s. In the beginning of the avenue, typology followed Agash's plan. In the beginning of the avenue is here, those headquarters here, until this one. Uh, and this is Agash's uh, typology, okay? Uh, as you can see in the left bottom picture, after the changing of the staff in charge of the enhancement plan into modernist professionals, the proposals changed to a modernist typology here. You can see, uh, this is the same avenue. In the beginning of the avenue, the typology is this, and the proposal for the, the remainders of the avenue, the proposal is this, and we have many conflicts here, and not of all uh, this project is uh, settled by now. Um, so in the top picture, it is possible to see the extension of demolitions of the traditional urban fabric to be replaced by the new progress image. So we have here uh, a line of central headquarters that were replaced by the avenue. Even this park was cut. Here in the edges, all uh, were overseen to be demolished to be uh, occupied by new buildings here and here. Okay, in this picture we can see the contrast of the Great Scale Avenue and the traditional urban fabric. Uh, those uh, plots in the edge were all uh, demolished to, to be replaced by uh, high buildings. So. And at that time, the public service of heritage protection was already working and some of the protected buildings were in the path of the great project. Although the staff of IFAN tried hard, it was not possible to spare some buildings. So this is uh, São Pedro Church. Uh, São Pedro, uh, this is the, the original environment of São Pedro. And it was in one of the central headquarters uh, that would be replaced by the avenue. So uh, they tried to remove the, the church to, to another plot, but it was not possible and um, they, um, it, it was demolished. Uh, 20 years later, another protect building, a very smaller protect building here, um, in the edge of the avenue, in the, in the plots in the edge of the avenue, overseen to be demolished also, or seen to be, to be demolished, uh, demanded much work from the municipal plan department to propose an adequate environment project, an environment project. It was, as I said, overseen 
to be demolished as it, it was settled in the EDGE headquarter. But the owner, the army, asked the fund for protection in order to prevent demolition. This is another study case, not solved until now. Okay, another project introduced introduced by Agash was the dismount of San Antonio Hill. The same committee of modernist architects proposed one of the numerous projects to the area. In this picture, we can see the proposal This is President Vargas Avenue. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Yes. Every now, and, every now and then there's a problem with the audio, but I think you can keep going for now. Okay, okay. So, um, in this picture, we can see the proposal of a highway. Uh, is the amount of hills and a uh, highway oh, wait where is the highway here of a highway here uh, that links the traffic in the south of the city to the docks uh, in the north shore uh, by a tunnel going through Concession here uh, the dismount of uh, Santana Hill was moved to another landfill here that now composes one of the biggest urban parks uh, in the world, that's Flamengo Park. So uh, this is the extension of Santana Hill and its constructed environment before the dismount here. There were many projects for the area before, before the demolition. Since 1930, there have been uh, many proposals for the area. Okay. Uh, there were many projects in the area before the demolition. And when it finally took place, there were so many negoti negotiations about how and where to build that this area became to be the most fragmented area in Rio city center. You can see the protected San Antonio convent. Uh, it was uh, situated in the middle level of uh, the hill and now after the demolition of the, it's in the top of the hill. So uh, th this is uh, uh, its property is the only remains of the hill together with the head of uh, Lapa Arquidu. Leticia, we cannot hear you, and I cannot hear you anymore. I'm afraid we lost the connection with Leticia. Oh, here you are uh, again. Ah, here, 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 I'm in, I'm in. Where, where did you, did I stop? Where Just did I the stop? last slide, but I think you need to share your screen again. We're not seeing your screen anymore. Okay, let me try. I'm sorry. No problem at all. The, you know, it, large network of people we can have problems with the connection oh there you go now now we can see it again yeah oh here i don't know or oh, here uh you know the last slide you were showing you can go back to that one and keep going okay so this is one of the changes and adaptions uh for this planade for santo antonio's planade made by the urbanism department of the city hall at that time no longer the capital of the country i would like to okay 
So here is a, a synthetic. Uh, I'm, I will try to synthesize all of uh, these uh, changes in the urban fabric because uh, this is um, 19. 1966. So this is uh, the continuous urban fabric of uh, Rio de Janeiro. So uh, within the 20th century, we have uh, the the hill, the remaining hills, the first uh, great project, uh, demolitions, demolitions of uh, convents, demolitions of hills, uh, openings of great avenues, demolitions of hills. Uh, landfills, uh, proposed pro projects uh, that uh, stopped in the middle, and uh, all of um, these um, dashed lines and uh, are borders uh, that um, must be sold to the to the fabric. Um, and here uh, we can see. Uh, a perspective map of Santo Antonio's planade here. This is this big avenue here that stopped because of preservation of this area that was demanded by the proper the the, the ownerships uh, the owners, not by the public uh, uh, protection service. So the same can be can be seen here. This conflict uh, here. Uh, great Avenue, the Gordon's Avenue, stopped facing. Are you hearing me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. The Big Avenue stopped facing uh, the the building of Santa Casa Hospital, uh, also protected. So uh, all uh, of these conflicts are printed in uh, the urban form of region of region. So I would like to briefly present you the background of heritage protection in Brazil in order to allow uh, you to understand why we today face some of the protection problems in big cities. The group in charge of the, continue, uh, of the constitution of Brazilian heritage were also the agents that promoted and projected modern urbanism and architecture. So the conflicts that usually occurred in other countries around the world were here handled by the same group of people. They were mostly influenced by the principles of Siam, but also by the guidelines of conservation. For the, this reason, they chose to protect the small cities in a position that were not going to face growth in future, so Preto, and uh, close to about seven hours uh, far from Rio, and uh, it was it had replaced as capital of Minas Gerais just uh, um, about 40 years before uh, the protection. So in bigger capitals uh, and bigger cities. Uh, they only listed isolated objects. So this is another, uh, it is a capital. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's not very different uh, morphologically speaking and uh, conservation speaking um, about conservation uh, from Ouro Preto. But this is a capital of the state, of the state. So uh, this, is, this was not protected, just a few buildings in, in this area. So uh, we have uh, those two charters uh, that led to very different manners of dealing with protected areas, following both allowed, uh, following both, both of them allowed the staff to act differently in each case. So uh, in conservation, the charter, the Athens Charter of 1931, uh, praise the character and external aspect should be respected, uh, especially in the neighbor of ancient monuments. And the Athens Charter of 1933 uh, of the International Congress of Modern Architecture 
uh, admits uh, that around some monument of historical value, you can change completely the environment and the vestiges of the past will be based in a new and possible, possibly unexpected ambience. So uh, these are com two completely uh, different uh, guidelines uh, that were uh, embraced uh, by Ifan in the beginning. So um, having uh, at the same time that uh, diversity was uh, replaced into an homogeneous here group of buildings in small towns, uh, huge areas of traditional fabric were allowed to be demolished in big cities. So this is uh, a protected building, uh, Candelaria Church. And this is the situation of Candelaria Church when, uh, uh, when the opening of uh, the Presidente Vargas Avenue. And here in Ouro Preto, the eclectic building was completely transformed into a colonial building to be an homogeneous um, site of uh, conserv conservation uh, buildings. Okay. So, having in inherited both the results of the fragmented modernist urbanism and the priority of integrating environments to protected buildings' character, heritage now faces some dilemmas. I'd like to present to you a key case of study that led me to my reflections. Facing two protected buildings of two very different morphological matrices. One shall which one shall guide parameters of occupation in the environment? This is uh, Castello Esplanade. Uh, after all uh, those projects and part projects built, part not. So this is uh, Agashi's plan. This is modernist plan. This is individual plans. And uh, this is the colonial fabric remaining. This is uh, Santa Luzia. So this is the result, morpho the morphological result of the numerous changes in Castello Esplanade. So there are two protected buildings, tangent to avoid. So. We have the Luzia Church, and we have here the old uh, Ministry of Education and Health, both tangent to this void that everyone wants to occupy. Each one faced a different uh, process in time. Each one experienced different morphological frameworks. This is in red. Santa Luzia, and this is in purple, uh, the MAC building. So, more oh, beyond the general plans that uh, changed this area, there were also small changes to the plot that had occurred along the years. So uh, uh, this is, uh, for example, a new alignment of the, of the uh, colonial typology without its uh, original environment, here the original environment, and here after the dismount of uh, the hill, and the other one that was born before the dismount of the hill. So the, uh, the co coexisting, actually coexisting uh, in the same, um, in the same urban fabric. So this is the relation now in the urban fabric of the Santa Luzia Hill and the Met building. So uh, this led me to, 
to wonder what happens between those fragments and is it possible to soft and gentle this contrast? Is it possible that fragments establish some kind of continuity? So those questions led me to Walter Benjamin's theory of philosophy that highlights the difference of borders and thresholds. Thresholds are those uh, umbrows of uh, the door, the doorway, the doorsteps uh, that links inside and outside. So uh, the difference of borders and thresholds and situates his reflection on transition process like the past from childhood and adult life. He remarks that the threshold must be strictly differentiated from the border. The threshold is a zone, change, transition, flow. Some of his commentators place Benjamin's theory in the zone between dream and concrete world. Ooh. For Tidman, the two poles of Benjamin's theoretical armor are grounded in the surrealistic dream theory and in the conception of concrete. For the outer, in the field and forces between concreteness and dream. Somewhere between dreaming and awakening, delirious and awareness, life and death. Um, transpointing philosophical reflections to physical world and to the city, we have in Rizek, more than containing and maintaining the limiting and separating as the border does, the threshold would be configured as a transition zone, not strictly defined, referring to flows and counterflows, places and indefinite times and of indefinite extension, a gray zone that merges, merges categ categories and mixes oppositions. And in gang gangnabing, in architecture, the threshold must precisely fulfill the transition function. That is, that is allow the walker and also the resident to be able to move without greater difficulty from a specific place to another, different sometimes, different, sometimes opposite. The trash codes does not only separate two ter territories, such as the border, but allows the transition of varying duration between those two territories. So that's what I'm looking for within morphology regions to translate into urban form the process of turning borders into thresholds. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I still there? Yes, thank you very much, Leticia, yeah. for this very interesting presentation, which shows us the relation between the, the transformation of urban form and these um, more philosophical concepts of thresholds and limit and it yeah. would be interesting to see how in terms of design these things can be translated for the yeah. uh, so before i ask for questions let me pose one right now but well, the point is so we have these pre-existing buildings the churches and then these you know 19th century 20th century planners were doing their grid on top of it and sometimes they are capable of establishing meaningful relations of form with those buildings, with those poles, or urban mm -hmm. poles, with the grid. So, you know, shifting, the forming the grid uh, to take this into account. But not in the case of the churches you have shown. It seems like the planner did not take in, it's not a matter of religion, it's a matter of, of you know, architecture, did not yes. take into uh, account any form of interaction with those buildings. So these poles, you know, civic poles are there and standing in the middle of the grid with no connection. And that does yes. not provide a very good urban design, in my opinion. No. Not no. The contrast, but because there's no polarity, there's no public space. Uh, therefore, uh, it is in those places where the interaction between the you know modern grid and the existing building has not been taken into account really in the past. What kind of transformation uh, project can be done today to re 
reconnect those um, elements. So that's my question for you. Uh, shall I listen for more or shall I? Uh, no, no, let's take this one and then we can go to the next ones. I got a few coming, but uh, okay. I'm heating it up, okay? Yes. Uh, your question actually is uh, my reflection. Uh, what kind of design can provide though this link uh, between those two fragments? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I think. Uh, we we or were always uh, observing too much uh, the features of the uh, the heritage uh, the protected buildings and uh, it's not what's going to rule the decisions actually what's going to rule the decisions is the city dynamics so uh, this is what i'm looking for uh, which kind of design? I think it's a kind. Uh, it's an issue of design, actually. What kind of design can be introduced in those areas? Because the voids actually are opportunities to link uh, those two fragments. Now they are only uh, empty spaces uh, and subutilized utilized spaces, but uh, they are opportunities to build uh, and to sew this, this very fragmented fabric. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question here from Yasemin. Okay, uh, do I read, uh, is it? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good to see you. <clears throat> First of all, it was really interesting presentation. I enjoyed uh, listening and um, the images were very nice as well. Um, I think your presentation about thresholds and how fragments can be read as thresholds in time uh, by itself is very, very significant. Uh, you referred at the end of your presentation to, uh, I don't know how to spell, but Gatnebin, yeah? Uh, yes, yes. yes. And here um, he said fulfilling the transition uh, function is very critical for architecture. Um, this one reminds me of these gated communities that currently we started to see everywhere in the world. Hmm. And uh, I wonder if Rio de Janeiro has also this kind of development and how can you relate what's going on in those developments? I'm sure that it, uh, those should be maybe outside of the city center. But I, I wonder if you ever questioned that. And I will have, this is the first question. I will have another one. And it is related to um, the term that you used. It, it was really striking for me. Surrealist dream theory and um, conception of concrete. On the one hand, there is a, this dream, kind of a surrealist like um, surrealist painters. And at the other hand, there's this conception of concrete, the new material that um, at the time it was really, it's not very, very new actually. It's, it's, it has been used since Roman times as we all know, but um, with the standardization, it became more easy to um, produce and distribute and use, I guess. So uh, it's a, it might be a comment or a question as well, but have you ever thought about Freud and how Freud's um, contributions in psychology regarding the uh, uh, dreams, how people dream, and how it is reflected um, in their real life. And does it have any at all, if there is any? I mean, I, I wonder if you thought about this as well, if there is any relation between the Freudian uh, psychology and this surrealist dream theory that I forgot now the person that you referred to has any relation at all. Just, um, it was, you know, uh, somehow key keywords for me that strike me a lot. Mm -hmm. So, okay. thank you. Um, I will unmute myself so you can talk better. Okay. Um, uh, actually, about the dreams, uh, um, 
what Benjamin uh, says is uh, the surrealistic dreams that uh, he's uh, um, a very uh, admi he is a, an admirer of uh, the surrealists but he thinks uh, that if you um, it's like a dream uh, I, I don't know if i can uh, find the words but if the dream cannot be uh, placed in um, in concrete word uh, and turned into action uh, that's that's what uh, he he uh, defends uh, actually um, he admires the, the possibilities of creating ideas into this uh, world of dreams but uh, he defends also that you might leave the uh, imagine the imaginary, imaginative world and put into practice uh, in the concrete world. So that, that's it. I've, I've never uh, thought about Freud actually about this because uh, I'm talking much about uh, the transition from the dream world to the concrete world, not about uh, uh, values or significances. You see, it's uh, the transition from the, the dream to the concrete world. That what's interesting me. That was very nice explanation, thank you. But uh, I think there might be some connections there. Uh, right now I cannot really clarify, but I think it's something that we can all maybe think about it. Thank you. And uh, okay, you remember, you. do you remember my- I don't uh, remember, can the you other repeat one? Uh, It was the about one, uh, uh, Gang Nadine. Uh, who said okay. that architecture, the function of architecture is to fulfill the transition function of, uh, that will be a threshold between inside and outside, which is okay. a very significant, I think, idea that we can see all around. And, <clears throat> and somehow your uh, presentation, uh, I think, made me think about fragments and how these fragments of uh, different thresholds at different time periods in history actually uh, writes the story of the city itself and uh, if you think like this based on your presentation then um, the question that I had in my mind was what about Rio de Janeiro of today the gated communities where are they in relation to this uh, the center the uh, study area that you examined and uh, shared with us Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, all those fragments are part of the of the history, the the, the city history. I agree, uh, and they were a result of conflicts, actually. And and I think we cannot uh, remain in those conflicts. And uh, all of those fragments uh, are now part of the, the city history. So that's why I'm thinking about transitions. I don't want anymore to deny what's, uh, what came from uh, the modernist uh, urban plans or the modernist architecture. Uh, and I would like to insert them uh, in the city as well as the protected buildings and the uh, colonial fabric. Thank you very much. I think it was very, very good answer as well. Okay, do we have any other question here? <laughs> Anyone else would like to make a comment here? Okay, so I'm gonna do some technicalities, which is stop.